About a month ago, on the 18th of August to be exact, I met a girl named Carla. The entire night, I was looking at this girl who I thought I had all figured out. I saw a beautiful girl and thought, wow, look at her. She has it all figured out. Everything is perfect in her life. She's doing great. And in reality, I didn't even know the half of it. Are you ready? I'm ready. So I've told you this before, but I just want to tell you one more time that you can say whatever you want. I don't want you to feel like you have to say more than you're comfortable with. You can say as much or as little as you want. The point is to just have a conversation, talk about um, mental health. Okay. okay. Let's go. So you told me your story before this, and I don't really think that there's a way to like ease into it. So I think we should just dive in. You were the age of 15 when you first attempted. Yeah, I yeah. just turned 15. You just turned 15? Yeah, it's just a couple months in. Do you remember where your mental health was at the years leading up to your first attempt? Mental health was never really a big talk in my house. Like mm -hmm. no one was like, oh, I need to go to the psychologist because I feel depressed or I feel sad or something. Like it was just something like you only go if you're crazy or you mm -hmm. only go if you really need to it's not a normal thing that you just talk about like if you're sad my mom will be like we'll get over it like it's just one day yeah. tomorrow you'll be fine i felt like i always just kind of kept my feelings in and i just i always tell myself that like it's just one day like you're fine like it's not a big deal like i honestly didn't even know what depression was until i was actually depressed like i didn't know the definition i didn't know it was a, like a disease i didn't know mental health was an actual thing i honestly don't even know where my mental health was at that point like i know i was sad and i remember one time like i didn't tell you this <laughs> it was my eighth grade year and like my mom was in the room with me because well i was, we used to share a room i was like writing a letter and i was it was literally a suicide letter but I didn't even know what it was like I was just saying like all my feelings and and I was just saying bye to everybody but like I was just telling, telling my mom how much I loved her I was literally saying bye to everyone in my life then I just like ripped it up and threw it away and thought nothing about it it's not something that you talk about in like a Latino mm -hmm. household yeah. or like Hispanic household like no I'm like fucking kill myself like, yeah like you don't talk about that mm -hmm. <laughs> so. so at that point in eighth grade were you having like suicidal thoughts? It was when all of that thing happened with that one girl that she drank the bleach. What was her name? Oh! Um, There's a full investigation underway into the circumstances surrounding the death of Port Coquitlam teenager Amanda Todd. Amanda took her own life on Wednesday after posting a video on YouTube about the constant harassment and bullying she endured at school and online. I remember it was during that time, sort of, uh -huh. that I kind of understood what it was and I kind of knew like oh my god like someone killed themselves like yeah. I didn't know someone like just killed themselves people just die but they don't kill themselves yeah like, it was stupid like I was ignorant like I feel like that sometimes like sometimes I just want to die and sometimes I don't want to be here and sometimes like what is life like what yeah is, like why is life even worth it but it wasn't the thing like I thought too much about it like I didn't dwell over it and I didn't like it was there but I wouldn't put too much thought into it. But was there anything like specific, <clears throat> like could you actually pinpoint something that happened in your life that made you feel that way? Or was it just like a mixture of everything? I feel like it was just a mixture of everything that was happening and everything that had happened to my life up to that point. Because, well, you know, like my dad left and we came from Mexico and I had, there was so many changes and I used to get bullied in school and it was so many different things. I can't really pinpoint something like this happened, so um, that's I, why I was, yeah, 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 yeah. Like it was just like I felt like it was just meant to happen. I guess that mm -hmm. life was just pointed in that direction that it was gonna happen at some point. Could you paint a picture for me, like what life was like when uh, you were fifteen? When I was fifteen, yeah. Like what was a normal day for you? My first attempt mm -hmm. was during the summer, so I was in a school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a normal day for me would be pretty much we still live in a trailer park, and I would get ready. And then I would go to my friend's house because she lived a couple trailers away. So I would always walk to her house and we'll just eat like hot Cheetos and walk around the like the trailer park. Like we would always walk all the time. Like we would because there's like two trailer um, parks right next to each other. So we would do like just laughs laugh. and just talk. And mm -hmm. that was literally just a normal day for me. Like didn't really do much. My mom was very strict. So mm -hmm. if any of my friends from school like asked me if I could go to the movies, like my mom would never 
she but, like yeah. would never let me i think she left let me like two three times and that was it and i had to just go to the movies and then go right back home like i couldn't really do much she only let me go with that friend because it was right there across so so was she like <clears throat> one of your really close friends yeah she was we actually connected in a lot of things like different things of our, about our lives we connected so we were really close friends mm -hmm. and like she always like treated me like a sister we don't really talk as much i see her sometimes but um that was a normal day for me like i never partied or anything yeah. crazy <laughs> never yeah never ever since you were at school i imagine yeah. like with you saying everything about like your mom was strict and you couldn't go out many places so i imagine since you're in summer you didn't see your friends a lot Never. But you did see that friend. Yeah, I saw her. Because she was living yeah. next to you. Was she someone that you would talk to about, like, no. nothing? Yes, it's not, it's not something you just talk about. Like, we would just talk about, like, boys or mm -hmm. a show or something. But we never really sat down and talked for real about, like, I'm feeling like this. Never. You think that was because, like, you were so young? Yeah, I felt like I was so young and also, like, I, I, like I'm saying, I didn't even know what that was until yeah. after it happened. I didn't know how to express my feelings. I didn't know how to talk to people about it. So I just pretty much always kept it in and just was like, it's just me. It's just something that I have. So you thought that like all those feelings were normal yeah, at that point? Like, you thought everyone was going through that? I felt like not everyone was going through that, but I felt like it was my business. Like it's, it's not socially acceptable. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember in elementary school, there was this one girl, she used to self-harm. And like a lot of people were like, oh, she's just doing it for attention. I didn't want to be judged in that way. Like, oh, you're just doing it for attention. You're just doing it for this. Cause like middle school and high school, like people are really judgmental. Like yeah. they'll literally just talk and talk and talk. I felt like I didn't want to be like, people for be like that. Like you just want attention. Cause I didn't want attention. Like I legit felt like that. Can you walk me through each of your attempts and just tell me each story as if I'm hearing it for the first time? My first attempt was when I was 15 and it happened in August. I was about to start freshman year, so I had just gotten out of middle school. So a lot of things were going on at that time, like how is high school going to be? How is my life going to take off from here? High school is a big step. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people don't see that. Middle school is so different. Friends were so different. And once you get to high school, everything changes and that's what happened. During the summer, I was um, I was having a lot of problems and stuff. One day, I did something really stupid, so I got in trouble, right? Really, really big trouble. Mm -hmm. So my mom, she was telling me stuff. My mom has changed so much from that, so I don't like want to bash yeah. my mom or anything. But she was just pretty much calling me every name in the book. And I say everything, she called me everything. And it was just like, damn, like, if my mom feels this way about me, like, what's so freaking good about me like mm -hmm. if the person that's supposed to love you the most is telling you this like there must be something wrong with you i can honestly honestly say that i was 15 and i was stupid and my first attempt was stupid and i could say that because it was mine and it's my story and i feel like i have the right to say that and it was stupid and that one was my fault it was completely my fault that's the only one i regret i felt so like alone i felt so like ashamed of myself i got to the point where like i just don't want to be here i don't want to live I'm getting in so much trouble with my mom, like that's why I'm saying it's so stupid because it was about something so small that I wanted to die. So I feel like that reflects everything that had already been going on in my life that when it got to that point, it just got to that yeah. point and I couldn't take it anymore. I remember we were laying down in bed because like I said, I used to share a room with my mom and um, she was still really mad at me and she was telling me all of this stuff. So I, I went to the restroom and um, I have a dog. We had like flea poison. Like I said, it happened when the girl drank the bleach. Mm -hmm. So I was like, what could kill me right now? Like, what could and kill me? That. And I thought of that. Like, it's poison. It says yeah. it's flea poison. It says it in the name. So I was like, I'm good with this. And I drank it. And it was disgusting. And I was taking chugs and I was crying my eyes out, looking at myself in the mirror. Like, you're really doing this right now. Like, you're literally deciding to do this with your life. And I didn't care. Like, I didn't care. After I did it, I just went back to the room with my mom and she didn't know. My mom took my phone away because I got in so much trouble that she took my phone away, but I asked her if I could talk to one of my friends and she she let me. So I texted my friend and like I told her what I had done and I feel like that was me kind of like reaching out for help because mm -hmm. I didn't want to die. But I just felt like that was my only way out. I texted my friend or I called her, I actually don't remember, but she told her mom and her mom called my mom and my mom literally said if she dies, no, she said, I'll check in the morning if she's dead. 
my mom said that. <laughs> she said it in front of me. So I was just like, I, I didn't fuck up in doing what I did. And I'm not trying to bash my mom because my yeah. mom's. Little, I love my mom though. <laughs> but but she literally said that about me, and I was like, damn, like I'm really going through with this. Like I don't mm -hmm. care then. But I wanted her to care, so I was telling her like, so you don't care about me. Like you don't care about anything. Like you gave me life, and you don't care about me. Like what's wrong with you? Like what if I am dead in the morning? Like what are you gonna do? So after a while, I think after she like actually realized what had happened, she told my brother. And my brother was the one that was like, oh, like, let's take her to the hospital. Like, what are you doing? They took me to the hospital. They called poison control or is that what it's called? Yeah. yeah. They called them and um, they explained everything that happened. And they just said, just check me. And they, like, took blood and everything. I was fine. Like, it didn't do anything, like, at all. So The poison didn't do anything? It didn't do anything. Oh, no? No. So, it was all pointless. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't do anything at all. I was like, damn, like, okay. But at that point, were you still hoping that it would have done something? Or were you kind of relieved? I feel like the first attempt was me reaching out for help. That was your cry for help? Yeah, that was yeah. my cry for help. I didn't want to die. Mm -hmm. I realized that, that I didn't want to die. That's why I texted my friend. That's why I did everything. Like I felt like I had so much more life to go to like you know mm -hmm. after that i was in the hospital for like a day or two and then they took me to Penny rich which is a mental hospital in china they put you on a hold which is a, a 5150 mm -hmm. which is a 72 hour hold where they evaluate you and see how you're doing and if they think that you're not danger to yourself or others then they let you go mm -hmm. but if they believe that you're still a danger to yourself or others they'll keep you again i was just there for three days because like i said like this is my cry out for help that experience kind of like changed me a little bit but it didn't change me enough to prevent yeah. it from happening again mm -hmm. me and my mom talked it out and we fixed everything from there i think that's when she started to realize that i was actually like there was actually something going on with me because before that she would tell my relatives what would happen and they're like, oh, she's just crazy. Like, she's just, she's just a teenager. Like, it happens. They'll minimize it, and it's not something that you should do because it's like an actual problem. People actually go through that. My mom, she didn't realize it right away what was happening, but she kind of understood more. She would take me to the therapy now. She would help me out more, but it didn't change like that. It didn't change overnight. Everything. Mm -hmm. Ten two was the one that changed my life. That happened a couple months after I turned one. And I had been going to therapy, I had been doing everything I was supposed to, but like I said, I stopped. I was already a freshman, and I was doing high school. There was this guy, and he was a senior. I feel like it's a normal thing, like freshman girls are just like, oh my god, he's so cute, so that senior. Um, <laughs> and he took advantage of that. At first, it was like, I would just look at him from a distance. He was like, like a god, like a trophy right there, like I never never thought much of it i think he posted something on facebook or i did i actually don't remember it was something like oh someone messaged me or talked to me or whatever and i don't know who messaged who first from there we started talking we talked for a couple weeks it was nothing like it was nothing but then i started to catch feelings and i started to like like this dude he knew what to say to me he mm -hmm. like brainwashed all my little brains and like i was like oh my god like he loves me and this and that, uh -huh. but he didn't. And I should have known that because, like, I would tell him, like, are we ever gonna be something? Like, are we ever gonna put a title on it? And he would always just tell me, like, oh, yeah, but I'm not ready. Or it's gonna happen, but just wait on it. And so I just, like, okay. okay. Yeah. I used to play soccer, and he used to play soccer as well. And so one day after practice, he's like, do you want to go to the store with me? In the high school that I used to go, there was like a little corner store down the street. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, that's fine. So we went. I think I got like water or something. And then he like drove in into like some palm trees. And he wanted to have sex with me. And <laughs> I was not ready. It's like, no, take me back to school. And he got so mad. Got out of there and took me back, dropped me off. Mm -hmm. And then I used to take the sun bus back home. And I got on the sun bus and he like broke up with me over the phone. Like he texted me. So I was so sad. I was like, is that all you wanted me for? Just for me to have sex with you? Like that's all you wanted from me? So I felt really terrible about myself. I was like, is that all I'm good for? A couple of days passed and we would still talk because I was still like, oh my god, 
We love him. <laughs> and he would tell me, like, oh, I feel depressed. And he's like, do you ever want to ditch with me? Like, school, like, I'll pick you up and we could just go somewhere. And I was like, no, like, I'm scared. Like, I was so scared to do that. I was like, no, I can't. I wanted to get back with him because, like I said, I was like, oh my god, like, I love him. I want to get back with him. I got to that point where I was like, this is what I have to do to get back with him. I texted him and the next he told me how he felt so depressed and everything. And I felt so bad because I felt like it was my fault. I texted him, like, tomorrow I'll ditch with you. So the next day, he picked me up in front of the school because I went on the bus and he had his own car because he was a senior and he picked me up and like we were driving around and everything. What happened, happened and that's all I'm gonna say. What happened, happened. And then he dropped me back off at school and I really thought like I was like pregnant. It was stupid, but I really thought like what if I'm pregnant? Mm -hmm. What if this happened? So I was freaking out for a lot of days. I was freaking out and I told him, hey, like, can you buy me a pregnancy test? Can you do anything to help me? And he literally said, like, no. Like, you're on your own. Wow. Yeah, and I was like, are you freaking kidding me? Like, like, what's going on? And I felt so, like, shocked. I was just so depressed for those days. And I just, I was so sad. I wouldn't eat anything. I would hit my stomach. I would, like, literally hit my stomach. I would do anything because I didn't want to be pregnant everyone would be so disappointed in me i couldn't do that to the people that i love that day um my friend came up to me and she was like have you heard what this person is saying and i was like no like what did he say <laughs> he told one girl that i had called them because i was stranded in like another city for him to pick me up mm -hmm. and i was like that did not happen <laughs> at all yeah and um that he went to go pick me up and that i was begging for it that i wanted it that pretty much like that killed me i was like what the heck like are you saying and if my friend knew i felt like other people were gonna know that was my first panic attack it was my last period and i went to class and i was with a friend i didn't tell him what happened but was, he knew there was something wrong with me because i was freaking out and he was one of my closest friends like i had known him since middle school i remember i told him like i'm not coming back like i told him i'm not coming back so I went home, I got on the bus, and when I got home, I just broke down. I literally walked home and I just threw myself to the ground and I was crying. People are going to start talking about me. This is not who I am. Why is he saying this about me? I blamed myself because I put myself in that situation. So I went to the restroom and there was a new bottle of aspirin and I just drank all of them. Like I just got a handful and just kept it coming, kept it coming all the bottle was gone and i remember i did it really fast because my brother went to a different school than i did so i didn't know what time he was gonna get home mm -hmm. but i got home before him that day i'm gonna do it i'm gonna do it now this is my chance yeah yeah i feel so relieved i'm not gonna lie i was like i was ready for it the first time i was like what did i just do mm -hmm. this time i was totally fine i was ready i deleted everything off my phone i I deleted everything because I didn't want to ruin his life. I didn't want anybody to go after him. And like an hour later, my mom got home and she was making food and she's like, oh, come eat. And at that point, I was like shaking. But I wasn't shaking because I was scared. I was shaking because all... Because it was kicking in. Yeah, everything yeah. was kicking in. Like, it was so weird. I was shaking. I, I was like this. I was like, my heart was racing and I could feel it and I could hear it. I literally could hear my heart racing out of my chest and she noticed and she's like what's wrong are you okay and i was like yeah no 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 i'm fine that was i was talking so fast like no no no, no. I'm yeah i'm fine i'm fine i'm fine she was like okay whatever and then we finished eating she went to her room and she lay down and after looking at my mom and she didn't think anything was going on she was going on about her normal day and i was like what am i doing like it kicked in and i was like what the fuck so i went to my mom's room and I hugged her and I didn't say anything, I just hugged her. I felt like that was me saying goodbye to her. <laughs> but then I don't know what happened and I was like, take me to the hospital. Mm -hmm. She was like, why? What happened? And she got really freaked out. And um, that's when I told her what had happened. Up to this day, my mom doesn't know the full story. She just knows that I was having trouble at school because I don't ever want my mom to know that something like that happened to me. She just knows I was having trouble at school or whatever. And she like, she just like, got up really quick and she gave me milk like they make me they made me drink a whole gallon of milk 
and she called my brothers and my oldest brother was telling me like don't you see what you're doing to my mom like you're just doing that for attention and i was like what <laughs> my mom didn't take me to the hospital right away because she knew what, what, what had happened the first time where they took me to another hospital for a couple of days mm -hmm. and she didn't want that to happen again so she didn't take me to the hospital right away i was at home throwing up for hours this happened like at three in the afternoon because i had just gotten out of school mm -hmm. and then i ended up going to the hospital like till nine ten at night i was at home throwing up i would drink anything i would throw it up right away i was throwing up blood at the end because there was nothing else in my stomach yeah i was begging her actually i was begging her i was like please 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 like take me like i'm so like i felt so sick i was i wanted to just fall asleep so she took me to the hospital but she told me we were in the car she's like don't tell them what you did she told me that she's like just tell them that you feel sick that you were throwing up mm -hmm. and i was like okay <laughs> and i was like in the hospital they gave me like a little bag and i kept throwing up and throwing up and throwing up and they were taking forever because they didn't know what i actually did then they took me to like a little clinic across the street which is a 24-hour clinic the doctor there was just like oh you probably just have a stomach flu and i was telling my mom because he went out of the room and i was like mom they're not gonna help me like you're just gonna let me die and <laughs> i wasn't putting it on her yeah but i was like you're not doing anything like i really like let's just go to the hospital so they took me back and i told them what i had done and they brushed me in the doctor came and he told my mom like your daughter could have died her liver we don't know if it's damaged we don't know anything yet they like actually put me in to the icu so i was in the icu for like two or three days i think when the aspirin level had gone down enough, like good enough to normal and everything. They sent me to a mental hospital. So I was at Loma Linda and I was there for three weeks. I was there for three weeks. And that was mostly because I kept telling them like, I'm not okay. I don't want to go home yet. Because I didn't know what I was going back home to. I didn't want to go to school. I didn't want to face everything that had put me in there in the first place. Yeah. How it works is you get assigned to our rooms. You have a roommate. I had one roommate and then she left a couple of days and then right away they put someone in mm -hmm. and I had a couple of roommates because I was there for a really long time that they just kept coming and coming and coming and I was yeah. still stuck but I didn't mind it because like I said I didn't want to I didn't want to face reality it was a good experience and it helped me a lot because they have classes where they teach you like coping skills they teach you about anger management or how to deal with a certain situation they just have so many resources that it really helped me i got out of the hospital after whatever time <laughs> and i went home and i didn't go back to my old house because we had moved and i told my mom like i don't want to go to the same school so she immediately like took me out of that school and enrolled me in the different school the same school that my brother went to mm -hmm. i didn't go to school for like two months because i wasn't ready I was just not ready like yeah like I can't it was so weird once I went back to school I had a couple of friends so I would go with them but they didn't know why I moved like people why did you move why did you move I was like oh I just didn't like it over there or something mm -hmm. like it's something again like you're hiding it you can't yeah. talk about it everything was still there all those feelings were still there time had passed already but you can't just move on from it right away life was hard and after that attempt that's when everything started when my anxiety started self-harming started it like changed my whole life because that's what made it real after your second attempt you started to self-harm mm -hmm. as like a coping mechanism yeah what was that like i had never done it before like i remember i used to tell myself like i'm never gonna do that to myself it was to that point where i didn't know how to deal and the first time i did it i was having a panic attack i just felt like sometimes i i had this thing where i couldn't control but i didn't know what a panic attack was because nobody ever told me what it was i was crying in my room and i was like how do i stop this like what what can i do to stop this i got a pencil like a lead pencil i like was wearing shorts or whatever pajamas and i just like put them down and i just started like scratching 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 until it burnt me like and so my skin was off and everything like, it felt so good <laughs> like it felt amazing like it stopped everything stopped i felt something other than my emotional pain i felt physical pain and that stopped it and i felt so relieved and then after that i just kept on happening mm -hmm. and that's how i coped with it i only did it to the point where i felt fine as a junior in high school, mm -hmm. and that was the hardest year I had ever gone through, like, junior year was so horrible. I was in such a low point in my life. I would get 
panic attacks every day. Every single day I would get one or two panic attacks. I remember I used to tell my mom, like, mom, take me to the hospital. Like, I'm going to kill myself mm -hmm. if I don't get help. But I didn't have insurance, so she didn't know what to do. I think one time it got to that point where I actually told her, I was like, mom, if you don't take me today, I'm going to kill myself. And that day she took me, but she took me to a therapist. She didn't take me to the hospital because in the hospital you could go, like, um, voluntarily and you could leave whenever. But she didn't want me to go away she didn't want that to happen again then i went to therapy for like a week or two i think i went to that therapist and she was really nice but the problem was the psychiatrist that i was going to and i had to go with him once a week with a psychiatrist you would pretty much only go like once a month he mm -hmm. just checks in sees how you're doing and how the medication's working at that time i had already taken medi medication before like prozac and stuff like that but I never liked it. I felt like it didn't do anything for me. I told him that I was like, I don't want to take medication, but I had to because I wasn't okay. He prescribed some pills like antidepressants. I couldn't sleep at night. Insomnia, is that what I said? Call? Like, I couldn't sleep at night. So he gave me sleeping pills and he gave me other pills for my anxiety. And the pills for my anxiety were out of end. Literally with those, if I had a panic attack, my mom would give them to me. I would knock out. Like, I would just knock out. That was how they were controlling my anxiety, and that's not healthy, and I hated yeah. that because that's not helping me at all. Like, I just get a panic attack, and you're gonna medicate me right away. When my mom would try to, like, give it to me, I would refuse it. I would, like, push it away. Like, I'll be panicked. I'll be like, I don't want that. Like, get that away from my, like, it was so bad. And every week, I would go back and be like, this is doing nothing. And I know you have to wait because with antidepressants, you have to wait, like, a month or two before you actually start seeing results. What doesn't wait are the side effects. Those happen like that right away. I felt nauseous. I couldn't sleep. I slept too much. I couldn't eat. I wasn't hungry. Everything like <laughs> you could think of, like it was happening to me. So he kept switching my medication and my body couldn't keep up with it. One day he prescribed this other medication called Remeron. And with that medication, one of the side effects was like suicidal thoughts. I would take it at night because it was a sleeping pill as well as a antidepressant. So I would take it, I would fall asleep, and in the morning when I had to wake up for school, I wouldn't wake up. I basically couldn't, it's not that I'm lazy, it's not that I didn't want to go to school, it's just like I couldn't even open my eyes because I was still so drugged. Mm -hmm. I would tell my mom this and she told the doctor and he put like the milligrams down I guess so it would be less strong, but it didn't help at all, like it was still the same thing. So after like the third day of taking it with like less milligrams i remember i had a good day and me and this other person that i was with for two years we had broken up so many things were going on in my life at that point i don't even know where to start so no. i was with him for two years so we had the same group of friends we had everything the same and when i broke up with him i lost everyone literally everyone i would eat lunch in the restroom my they didn't know what to do at school, like I had nobody, I lost all my friends. This medication just pushed me over the edge. After the third day, like, I had a, I had, had a good day, and I remember, and I went home, and I was watching a movie. Out of the nowhere, I was like, I'm gonna kill myself. It just happened like that. Like, I was not thinking about anything, I was just like, I'm gonna kill myself. Like, I'm gonna kill myself right now. My mom hides all the pills from me. <laughs> After the second attempt, like, she had to hide all of the pills from me. I went to her room because I was home alone. Mm -hmm. So I was, like, looking for anything that I could get my hands on. And I found my Ativan, I found the Remeron, and I found some aspirins and stuff like that. So I just took all of that at once and was just like, okay, how for the best. And that's it. And I didn't say anything else. I called that one person. I called him and I told him what I had done. I don't even know what I why I did that. Like your uh, ex? Mm hmm But I don't know why I did that. Like I said, like it's so weird because it's like, why are you calling me? Like you're just gonna kill yourself. But it wasn't like his fault or anything like that. Yeah. Like it was just it was just too much. He called my mom. My brothers again were like, Don't you see what you're doing? Like you're hurting me. You're hurting my mom. Like you're just stupid. Like why do you keep doing this? If you're gonna do it, do it right. I was at the hospital and they did the same thing, like always, they took out blood, called poison control, they, you know. I was there for like two weeks because they couldn't find a bed at a mental hospital because they're so full because yeah. a lot of people go through it and people don't realize that. They were just waiting to mm -hmm. find space for me mm -hmm. somewhere. I guess a bed opened up, like at an emergency mental hospital, it's not a big one. They, they don't have as much resources. So when they took me to the hospital, I would sleep in a recliner that was it and it was in a small room smaller than 
this room, I know you guys can't see, but <laughs> it was small. The hospital was the shittiest hospital I've ever been to. It was literally a small room, recliners, like I didn't even get a bed, I didn't get anything. We had a small TV. If we ever went outside, it wasn't even, a, it was just concrete and it was four walls. I was there for so long and my psychiatrist, the doctor didn't want to let me go. She, like I kept telling her like I'm fine because I didn't want to still be there when I was 18. Because once you turn 18, you're with adults. You're with the actually like hardcore type of thing. Like it's different and they scare you with that. Like that's one of their tactics. Like you're like, you need to get your shit straight because you don't want to be with adults if you ever come back here. Everybody was trying to help me to get out. Like all the social workers were trying to help me. But the only person that has authority is my psychiatrist, the doctor. And she kept saying no, like she's not fine. She's done this so many times. Like what makes you guys think that she's not gonna do it again? She's not just gonna go home and kill herself. She wouldn't let me go until like one day she came in and just like, you're going home and I started crying. I was like so excited because other people kept coming and then they kept leaving and coming and leaving and coming. And I was just like, I wanna leave too. Like, yeah. My mom couldn't even visit me. It was only over the phone. I did not see my mom for like three weeks. I couldn't not oh. talk to anyone. I left and I went back to school and school was still shit. Everything was still shit, nothing changed. I lost all my friends. I pushed everyone away. I didn't have anyone. I, I had nothing. I had literally nothing. I would miss school three, four times a week. I just didn't care. My GPA was so low, it was like zero point something. Some teachers tried to like, they helped me to make it up, but it wasn't gonna make much difference. Junior year was the hardest and like, I would see everybody like, like prom, people would go to prom. And I didn't get to my junior prom, I didn't do anything because I was like so depressed I didn't want to do anything. I felt so ashamed, I felt so embarrassed and I felt like my dignity, just everything was taken away from me. Like I lost myself, I fell into this like pit of nothing and I was nothing. And I started self-harming again because I stopped for a while and I started again because it was like I felt so numb. Life was happening and I was just there stuck. I wish I could tell you life gets better, but it doesn't. You grow up and your problems grow up with you, but I can tell you that it gets easier. I don't know why life is the way that it is or why God decided to make us the way that we are. I'm so sorry for how hard it has been, but know that it's not your fault. Know that you are so worth it. Know that you're loved. I sometimes wish I could go back in time and tell you that you're not alone and that one day you're going to look at yourself and love yourself but I haven't even learned that yet myself. I'm so sorry that I wasn't strong enough for both of us and that my weak mentality put us through hell, but I'm also glad it did because that shaped us and that shaped the way we are today. We are caring, loving, compassionate, and most importantly, we are strong. I am never going to let us lose our fight with these demons. Every day is a different battle, but I will do my best to win this war for you. You deserve so much more than what you got. You deserve to be happy and have a normal life. You deserved it all. I am so sorry that it didn't go like that. Thank you for being strong for both of us. And I love you. Hmm. <laughs> I literally hated myself back then. I still do sometimes, but I legit like hated myself. I can't even look at myself in the mirror. Like I remember I would like stare at myself for hours and just just cry and just yell on myself and just be like you're so worthless like you're nothing like nobody loves you no one's ever going to love you like where did that come from and that i have no idea where that comes from and i just remember like punching myself sometimes because i didn't know how to how else to make me feel something how else to feel anything for me feel sorry for myself how to do anything like i literally hated myself so bad that i like Literally, like, <laughs> all this video is about me killing myself because I hated myself so bad. I hated everyone. I hated my life. I hated living. I still do sometimes because it hasn't gone away and it's not going to go away that easy because it's something that I just learned to live with. It's an everyday thing. Some days are good. Some days are bad. Some days I still stare at myself in the mirror and just look at me and see nothing. Literally see f shit. And I tell myself sometimes, like, I'm having a panic attack 
and I'm like, you're shit, and that makes it so much worse, and it's just, and then me talking to myself is like a battle in my head, and it's just like, you're worthless, and I hate you, and then the other part of me is like, no, like, stop, I love you, like, be strong, like, don't do this, and like, it's not over for me, like, my life's not over, and sometimes I feel like it is, sometimes I feel like I need to have everything already, I need to have my life straight, and I feel like dying, and I feel like no one loves me and I feel like I don't have any friends which I don't, I really don't like literally I remember telling you this when I was like I have no friends I wish that I had friends that I could go out with but instead I'm just at home doing nothing hating myself having a panic attack alone and I'm just like like I put myself here like there was so many ways that my life could go to but it ended up here like how is that? Just everything in my life has been so horrible and it has been so bad. I feel like it was just meant to happen. Like I said earlier, like, this is meant to happen. And some days I feel like I'm just gonna end up killing myself one day. Every day I think about that, like I'm literally gonna die. Like I'm gonna kill myself one day. <laughs> I think I am. I feel like that's how I'm gonna die. I'm just gonna kill myself. Hey guys, if you've made it this far through the video, um, I want to quickly say thank you so much. It means a lot to me that you would be willing to sit through a 40 minute video of my friend telling her story. So thank you. What you just saw was the last conversation that Carla and I had and it got really intense and emotional to the point where I had to stop the cameras. I want to make it clear that Carla did tell me that I was free to use any of the footage that I had but for this particular conversation, I felt like it was wrong for me to share it. Not because of how intense the conversation was, but because how vulnerable Carlo was in that moment. I felt like it was more of a thing where it should be between us and not the internet. But then I thought about it and this is the whole reason why we're doing this series because we want to bring awareness to the struggles that people with mental health issues go through on a daily basis. So I'm just going to summarize a bit of what she said. She told me that the other day she had a panic attack and that she was really considering killing herself. And I knew that she still dealt with depression and anxiety. I know that that's not something that goes away easily or sometimes at all but I didn't know that she still faced suicidal thoughts. Um, I didn't know that that was a reoccurring thing that happens kind of often in her life. So I asked her, why don't you go back to therapy? Why don't you start taking your medication again? If there was something that could help you get out of this state of mind and out of this dark place, why wouldn't you do it? And in many ways I was really confused because I haven't dealt with something this severe and so I, I just couldn't comprehend. I didn't, I just couldn't get it. She explained it to me in a way that I'll never forget. She said, battling with chronic depression is like fighting to become cancer free. I'm fighting this fight with my head and my demons and if one day I kill myself, then I lose my fight. Similar to how a cancer patient would lose theirs. I'm just gonna throw this out there because I know that Carla is watching, so the night that we met, um, it caught me really off guard when you just casually mentioned that you tried killing yourself multiple times because standing in front of me was this really beautiful girl. And I don't know if you know this, but you're really pretty. And from an outside perspective, it looks like you have your life together. You look happy, but that's just your exterior. And I know that that's what you want people to think. And that's how so many other people feel. Everyone is going through some shit. Everyone has demons. Everyone. Some might be smaller than others, but everyone has their own battle that they're facing. And it made me so sad to think that you ever felt so alone to the point where you felt like you didn't belong on this earth anymore. And that goes for anyone dealing with this shit. Depression, anxiety, addiction. They can be very manipulative illnesses. They like to take you by the hand and lead you into a dark corner and convince you that the world doesn't need you until you get comfortable there and you learn to live with it or you listen to it and you let it get the best of you. And I know that shit's not easy. 
So when she told me that one day there's a possibility that she might lose her fight, I lost it. And I started crying and I said, I know this isn't about me or anyone else at all. This is your journey. But from an outside perspective, I don't want to have sat here and had this conversation with you, film this video with you, be your friend, get to know you, and then find out next week or in a year's time that you committed suicide because I would care. Your family would care. Your boyfriend would care. His family would care. And this video made me realize so much and I hope it makes you realize things too. Carla and, and the audience, I hope it opens your eyes to how serious this is. It sucks because I like to fix things and I can admit that. I am someone who likes to reach for the happy ending or make sure that whoever's watching is satisfied and i have to admit that i can't do that with this video i can't fix carla as much as i wish that i could not for my own personal benefit but just so i can see that she's happy and that she overcame her struggles no one can fix her only she has that power to do that to pull herself out of the darkness of course everyone can play their part and help but at the end, it's her effort and her will and her strength. And all I can do, all anyone can do, is offer support. And I hope that you know that you have that from me, Carla. Depression is a really weird thing because one day you can have the worst, hardest, shittiest day. And then the next day can be a little bit better, good, positive, maybe even happy. But that doesn't mean that everything has changed all of a sudden. It just means that you had a good day. And I hope that anyone that's dealing with the same things that Carla's going through, I hope that you have many more happy days. But for each bad day, I hope you know that you have people there to get you through it. And at the end of the day, I hope that you never lose your fight. One of the many reasons why I wanted to make this video was because of the large stigma around mental health. It's still something to this day that is a thing. I don't know why society likes to make people with mental illness or anything that's not deemed as normal um, an outcast, but. And already from the first video, so many of you reached out to me and, and you told me your stories and, and you told me how thankful you were that, you know, this video was coming about and it just it made me happy and Carly even told me that some of you reached out to her and I could feel the support and the love and that's all I wanted at the end of the day since we're being so raw and honest here um I really don't know how to end this video <laughs> I will leave the numbers to the suicide prevention hotline and a depression hotline in the description down below if you want to check that out if you need that um it's there for you and I'm there for you so Thank you guys. See you next time.